All right, let's get started. So um, welcome, I'm Scott Podolsky. It's my honor to get to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Jeremy Green, and to bring him back to our department for this talk today. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Green received his undergraduate degree, his master's in anthropology, and his MD and PhD, all from Harvard. And he completed his medicine residency training at the Brigham, and while with our department, among other things, co-directed our own introduction to social medicine course at HMS. Since then, he's done fantastic things at Johns Hopkins, where he's now the William H. Welch Professor of Medicine and the History of Medicine, as well as the Director of the Department of the History of Medicine and the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine, all at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. At every stage of his career, Jeremy's had the capacity to look into the future and somehow, preternaturally, see what was going to be a critical issue in medicine and to be able to put the deep, the deep work into historically framing such issues in time to shape national and even global discourse around them. We saw this with his first book, Prescribing by Numbers, Drugs and the Definition of Disease, published by Johns Hopkins in 2007, and with the second book, Generic, The Unbranding of Modern Medicine, published by Hopkins in 2014. We certainly see this yet again with his current book, The Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology, History, and the Limits of Tele uh, Telehealth, which he began well before the COVID pandemic changed how we all thought about medical, uh, sorry, changed how we all thought about and practiced telemedicine. Once again, Jeremy deeply frames his history of medicine at a distance, the uses and limits of technology, and its relationship to social medicine itself. His work was supported by both a Faculty Scholars Fellowship from the Greenwald Foundation and a G13 award from the National Library of Medicine. So with that, I'll soon hand this over to Jeremy. Just a reminder that you're welcome to use the Q&A functions for questions, which we'll share and we can discuss at the end. And like our se other seminar talks, we'll be hosting this talk on our Departmental Global Health and Social Medicine YouTube channel, uh, and with that, I'll really hand over to Jeremy. Well, um, thanks so much for that generous introduction, Scott. And it's such a delightful thing to be able to address the, um, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine um, colloquium series here. I, obviously, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do any of the things that I do as a clinician historian um, without um, really the, the, the friendship and mentorship of um, so many people in, in global health and social medicine and other pieces of Harvard Medical School, the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics, the Department of Medicine at the River Women's Hospital. So I, I have far many scholarly debts here than I could account for. Um, I, I do want to mention, of course, you know, I got to see many of you most recently at the memorial service for Paul Farmer, um, and the, the loss of Paul is still something that... Um, I, I, I still can't process really, but every time I get to um, share a, an opportunity to be in conversation with those whose lives have been impacted by Paul, I, I appreciate a chance to help make more meaning of, um, of what we do with, um, with, with, with his, um, his oversized legacy. Um, and in many ways, the work here and the question that motivates this book, The Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology, History, and the Limits of Telehealth, comes out of a question and a conversation I think Paul you know, repeatedly pushed me on, which is, you know, as as historians um, of science and medicine and technology, it's easily to be somewhat dismissal, dismissive of a technological fix. Um, this idea, this dream that better technology will just lead to better health, which which rarely actually takes place, right? And yet at the same time, um, to, to think that technology can't animate meaningful dreams as, as to how to produce better forms of health equity and a preferential option for the poor, well, that really short changes a lot of possibilities as well. So the question I want to begin this talk with, and it's a fundamental question of the book, can the right technology undo widening disparities in access to health care? And, you know, I'm here in my clinic today here at East Baltimore Medical Center. It's a community health center that was founded in a re relation with a community group um, in relation with Johns Hopkins as an immediate response to the 1968 um, uprisings after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. here in the city of Baltimore. And um, in my clinic, I saw a part of my patients um, remotely, um, and uh, these visits were made possible by telehealth, telemedicine. Um, I saw a part of my patients in person, and they're made possible by the technology of this clinic, which you know didn't exist before 1968, and is a technological response in some ways to um, to certain forms of uh, social movements um, demanding access to care. So I'd like to sit with these questions because um, <clears throat> here we're talking about telepresence and telehealth, and the book has a lot to do with telepresence and telehealth. Um, our conference today is made possible by this medium. All of us have experienced in some way in the past few years being um, a telepatient, if not a teledoctor. 
Um, and, um, you know, part of what we do as historians is, you know, remind us, you know, constantly provide this kind of irritating poke that this thing that we think is new is not as new as we think it is. And that the history of telehealth and where it came from, what dreams were promised along with it, actually matter quite a quite a good deal, right? So a lot of the platforms and the social hopes of what telehealth could do um, as it took shape in the late 1960s, in the early 1970s, and the same time that this community health center I work in was taking shape, um, were part of a series of hopes that might be invested in what a technology could do to bring greater equity and healthcare access in the United States. Um, how telehealth might be a technological platform to create new preferential options for the poor, among others. Um, so um, again, telemedicine <laughs> itself, though, is fairly agnostic to that. So we, there's a lot of efforts today to figure out how to bend the arc of telehealth access um, or how to transform our relationship between electronic media, computing, artificial intelligence, um, wearable devices, Internet of Things to help provide greater health equity. And we held a conference on this subject, wide ranging conference just a few months ago here in Baltimore. but. As many healthcare providers, and I know that many in the audience today have had um, analogous experiences, I'd love to get to them in the Q&A, the deployment of telehealth in the acuteness of the COVID-19 pandemic, going back to March, April 2020, in many cases widened disparities in access to care rather than resolving them. And so in my own experience, you know, here, my clinic was shut down. It's a safety net clinic. Um, I, I do a largely urgent care practice. And I found that not all of the patients that would have been able to walk in the door, um, we have a sliding scale, we, we, we have no, um, you know, we're very clearly agnostic to citizenship status, immigration status, insurance status, we are a safety net institution, we'll see anybody. Um, and so that was not true of our telepresent version of our clinic. And my own telemedical experience in the first year of the pandemic, there was a tight correlation between um, self-designated white race, non-Hispanic ethnicity, non-Medicaid insurance status, and the ability to successfully um, access a full televisit with me as a provider or with other providers as well. So that the digital media added new barriers to access rather than flattening them. And at the same time, the pandemic was a boon time for concierge models of care that were explicitly built on proprietary telemedical platforms. There are membership fees, these organizations, in which telemedicine was marketed as a marker of exclusivity rather than inclusivity, right? A form of health as commodity rather than health as right. Now I should mention, I didn't give a conflict of interest slide. I have no financial in, in, <laughs> interest either way for partner MD. This is just one of many concierge sites that was similarly promoting telehealth in the pandemic as a reason to sign up for a concierge medical model for an added fee. So as a historian, I found a paradox here and this paradox really suffuses this book because if you go back to the origins of telemedicine in the late 60s and early 70s, the technology promised to remove barriers of time and space to remove the social geographic problems of access to healthcare, to undo social disparities in access to care. And so the first theme of this lecture is, does telemedicine or do the electronic media through which we are increasingly able to conduct care, eliminate health disparities or augment them? And I'll sit with that for a moment um, because the book as a whole is not just a history of telehealth. It's, um, <clears throat> it's sort of a, a, a look at the role of the electronic mediation of, of, of medical care in general, specifically focusing on the American example, but looking at four different electronic media over the last um, you know, century and a half or so, the, the telephone, the radio, the television, and the networked computer. And part of the reason I want to look at these four things is that I think part of the reason we continue to reinvent both the hype and harm of things like telehealth or the networked, the internet of things in healthcare is that we tend to forget the communications technologies or medical technologies. So I'm trying to rediscover a history of how we have both had tremendous impacts. I mean, I, my, my clinic today required computer, telephone, wireless devices, um, and yet we've learned to not see them as medical technologies and ask why that is. Um, so there's four parts. The first looks at the telephone, um, how, how is it that um, dreams of uh, flattening space and time and providing access to care everywhere animated um, medical journals um, and forms of public health policy um, just 
just a few years after Alexander Graham Bell does the first demonstration of the telephone in 1876. Medical journals in the 1880s are full of accounts of doctors that are now able to just see their patient by telephone. And there's new devices, um, telephonic uh, chest pieces that can be screwed onto a telephone so that a cardiologist um, can listen to the heart of a patient, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away. And as you can see in this advertisement, which is from um, this Camel Cigarettes, R.J. Reynolds, um, the, um, the, the telephone is also a way of accounting for what it means to be on call, the ever accessibility of the presence of a physician. The second part of the book looks at radio, um, looks at wireless technologies and um, why it is that uh, wirelessness allowed for a way of a very fundamental way of thinking of the physiology and tracking the physiology of patients at a distance, which was crucial to enabling things like intensive care units and telemetry devices. And yet, to the extent that we think of a telemetry device as a medical technology, we've forgotten to understand it as a radio technology. Or to the extent that we get excited about new forms of Wi-Fi connectivity in devices in the Internet of Things, we forget that actually wearable devices were already being developed, like the Holter monitor back in the 1940s. So trying to recover what has changed and what is constant in the wireless impact in medicine. Um, and of course, one particular device, the pager, being an extension of the ever accessibility of the physician. Um, and I'll just highlight briefly, you know, all of us, I think, have experienced by now this phenomenon known as phantom pager syndrome, right, where you feel the buzzing of a pager in your pocket, even though the pager is not on you. And when I say all of us, I mean that at this point, this is a phenomenon that was described among physicians. But as we as as the broader population began using mobile phones, I think many of us know this as feeling the vibration of a phone in our pocket when a phone is not in our pocket. So understanding the history of wireless is also understanding the, the forms of exhaustion and burnout and um, added labor and added accountability that come with something that is putatively a labor-saving communications device. Now, the central part of the central chapters on television medicine, I'll be talking about in more detail today. And this has to do with what kinds of dreams telemedicine animated in the 60s and 70s when cable tel technology, which is, you know, the internet of its time, and, and, and to, to commit an anachronism, um, promised a, a greater connectivity between doctors and patients in different areas by being able to set up a camera, a camera, a screen, a screen over a long distance separation. And that cable promised all sorts of things, both in terms of individual doctor patient relations and of addressing barriers of access to care for populations. And the final section of the book looks at mainframe computers. So in the 1950s and the 1960s and the first decade of medical computing, there were vast dreams of how bringing computers into hospitals. There was a, a key demonstration project at Mass General Hospital um, from 1962 to 1968, which was a massive failure, um, but also in some ways a tremendous success and that it enabled the, the company that designed it to go on and actually develop ARPANET and the internet. internet. Um, but the physicians resisted the input of computers into hospital areas. Um, Health systems like Kaiser Permanente then does that try to design new forms of computers, new forms of health systems that put a computer at the center and built a kind of a new kind of clinic around it, new models of preventive care that are based on computing. That's the book in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> I, ideally, I, if we were all in a room together here, I'd probably stop talking now and we would just you know have an open conversation. But si since since all I can see is my own head, and Amy's and the, and the words Dr. Scott Harris Podolsky, what I'll do is give you a few more slides on how to think um, with the problem that the history of telehealth poses for the current promise we have of digital medicine today, or digital public global health today. So does telemedicine eliminate health disparities or augment them? I'd like to couple this with a second theme, which has to do with aesthetics, which is to say that even before telemedicine existed as a real practice, it existed as an imaginary means to eliminate geographic barriers to access in healthcare. Some of you may have seen this image um, from 1939 from the famous um, Jewish-German uh, physician and illustrator Fritz Kahn titled The Doctor of the Future Using Radio and Television to Give a Consultation to His Patients Aboard the Ship India in the South Seas. And we know this kind of image, right? Because we see versions of it today. It's an aestheticized techno-futurism. Information technology brings people closer, removes problems of distance and time lag, and can actually correct even global disparities in access to care. Um, and I mentioned aesthetics here to name this second theme of today's lecture, 
all of us have now become scholars and practitioners of telepresence one way or another with every next Zoom meeting we're on as like today. We understand the aesthetic and affective dimensions these practices have in our lives. And so just think for a moment about the design of this interface that you're attending the seminar through, which has been like lovely, lovingly customized by Amy Craig to be more than just the generic Zoom. But we've all learned to mitigate some of the effects of Zoom fatigue, organize the backgrounds behind your cameras. In this case, I'm blurred here so you don't see the messiness of my clinic. Um, we've gotten used to certain forms of pathology. In my case, it's an incipient neck strain that I already feel from today's Zoom, right? And so there's both aesthetic success and, and aesthetic recoil, right? And we're accustomed to stories of success. I'm showing you some images here from a book by John Harwood called The Interface, which is a history of design at IBM that describes how IBM, under the leadership of Thomas Watson's slogan, good design is good business, overcame initial critiques of unfeeling alienation of computing to help welcome the computer into everyday business life. And there's a question of to what extent did that happen or not happen? in the world of medicine, because aesthetic works both ways. Many encounters with new technologies produce um, aesthetic and affective disconnects. And here's a cartoon um, critiquing the bedside manner done through the Bell picture phone, a, a failed telemedical technology of 1964. And so I want us to look at these problems of presence and absence in early modes of telehealth, both on the one-to-one -one level between a doctor and patient, and on a broader level of disconnect of whether this technology reduced barriers for access to underserved populations or increased them. Um, because not everyone embraced the promise of telemedicine. Um, many stakeholders invested in rolling out telemedicine, doctors, nurses, engineers, health systems planners, community organizers, sociologists, and other social medicine practitioners struggled to understand the negative affect and suspicion which many users recoiled from the screen. Um, what, what all of these thinkers wanted to know, did television medicine do to the telemedical encounter? And how could this interface be better designed to tune out those uncanny feelings of disconnect that telepresence brought with it? So the remainder of this talk will do two things. First, explore these three themes in theorizing telepresence. There's a social medicine of telepresence in the 60s and 70s. Um, there's internal concerns of early adopters who sought to define telemedicine to enhance doctor-patient interactions. There is social engineering of doctor-patient relations, many who thought that by actually being able to design the interface, you could produce a better doctor-patient interaction through telehealth. And the third, questions of symmetry, this question of could the telehealth interface actually flatten out the power relations between doctors and patients in good ways. Um, but the second theme is to understand how telehealth is specifically rolled out in the late 60s and early 70s as a technological fix to social disparities and access to healthcare in a way that referenced both a racialized medical ghetto of its time, um, understood during America's urban crisis of white flight, as well as barriers in rural health, um, understaffed due to flight of people in capital to urban and suburban Americans in the late 20th century. I'm gonna breeze through these fairly quickly because I wanna to get to a Q and A. Uh, the first would be enhancement. And this is a Boston story, right? The clinic in which the term telemedicine is invented starts in 1968 in gate 23 of Boston's Logan International Airport, where a small satellite clinic for the Mass General Hospital had been set up at the request of hospital president, John Knowles. Now, Dr. Kenneth Bird, an internist and another clinician, staffed the clinic in person during peak travel hours and were on telephone call by pager the rest of the time to a group of nurse practitioners who staffed the clinic on a 24-hour basis. And the limitations of medicine by telephone soon became apparent to Bird. Um, he had been reading the popular media theorist Marshall McLuhan and was convinced in the value of television as a new electronic extension of man and sought to extend the diagnostic capacity of urgent care nurses by adding television to this telephone circuit and added a group of closed circuit TV cameras between Logan and MGH just a few miles away, long lenses for portraits, macro lenses for close-ups, special adapters so that, that actually an EKG could be sent along the television screen or a blood smear um, or an x-ray. And all of this information fed into the console that Bird had tucked in the ED at MGH um, in, to be the telemedical consultant. He basically set up a media lab for doing experimental medicine at a distance. And when this clinic opened in April of 1968, there was great fanfare. The Boston Globe reports, quote, doctors are never more than a few feet away from their patients, even though the latter are at the airport and the doctors are at the hospital downtown. Or as a third year medical student at Harvard Medical School, rotating through the clinic, described it, in Bird's clinic, the doctor's stethoscope is three miles long. 
Now, if that imagery of telepresence was invoked a form of science fiction in the present, that's no accident. The medical student in question is Michael Crichton, who was already a celebrated science fiction author and, you should know, quite a fan of the Department of Social Medicine. Just a year earlier, his first novel, The Andromeda Strain, had been published to critical acclaim and optioned as a blockbuster movie in the emerging genre of a biomedical thriller. And Crichton was already at work on his second book, Five Patients, which devoted a chapter to the science fiction already present and the contemporary practice at the medical station at gate 23. And like Crichton, Bird saw his clinic as a form of science fiction in the present. And he described these jet setting patient populations in the airport as a good example of a future population that will learn to early adopt technologies. Um, but he was very concerned about fidelity. And I think a lot of early telemedicine research has to do with proving that what you can do over a screen is good enough to what you can do in person. And Bird worked with an engineer from CBS named Stanley Cranin um, to produce <coughs> images like this as a form of data, right? Um, if a doctor can see a lesion in the blood vessels of an eye in person, would that same lesion be visible to another doctor looking at that eye on a TV screen several miles away? And so this image above, which is in the MGH archives, it shows photographs of television screens that themselves depict images of the conjunctiva of model patients at different camera settings to see, well, at what point is that diagnostic capacity good enough? And they collected hundreds and hundreds of, of studies like this, comparing the images to see at what point do you lose the ability to discern. Um, and by the early 70s, though, Bird, along with the telemedical nurse practitioner, Marie Kerrigan, who you can see here in the screens on the right, began to theorize more broadly on what television might do. And using some of the materials that they've worked with, so in a telemedical circuit, they suggested interactive television allows interpersonal communication across distances to recreate and even enhance face-to-face -face communication. <laughs> the telemedicine circuit, they continued, produces an alteration in time and space, which actually expands the role of the physician. The fundamental doctor-patient relation is not only preserved, but is often augmented, enhanced, and seemingly more critically focused. So by, Bird, by Bird's model, right, telemedicine produces a more powerful physician model. Um, now, this was not always seen as a good thing. Augmentation by the early 1970s this audience knows well the kinds of critiques of medical authority that were taking place. And a few other clinics had attempted to set up staff meetings using televisions at the head of the table. And in one clinic in Lakeview, Minnesota, clinic staff began to complain that the TV screen was too large and it had a giant head of the physician. And they created what, what, what they called a face of God problem, that the relative power of the physician was augmented in a way that made clinic staff uncomfortable. So what they did to resolve this in Lakeview was they literally took the television physician off the pedestal and put it on the floor so that the clinic staff could look down on the physician instead of looking up. Um, and <clears throat> this is one way of saying that enhancement could actually be inverted, right? And to the extent that which the TV could enhance the physician's authority, it also provided a way of re-engineering re that. So, um, uh, the media study scholar Ben Park, who wrote an extensive report on telemedicine for the Rockefeller Foundation in the 70s, and the health technology analyst shown here, Maxine Rakoff, who oversaw a, a massive federal grants program into demonstration projects in telehealth, became fascinated by these kinds of distortions like the face of God problem. And in June of 1973, the pair met in New York with Park's longtime friend Irving Goffman to see if the famous sociologist could help to understand what was happening and what was not happening in these televised doctor-patient encounters. So what did telehealth change? Rockoff had read Goffman's presentation of Self in Everyday Life, um, and they had, a com they had a set of conversations over about six hours to theorize telepresence. And Goffman suggested one of the problems of establishing presence in telemedical encounters lay in the fact that the two figures, the doctor and patient, inhabited different backgrounds. And when two people communicate in the same room, he pointed out their backgrounds also communicate and they share communication space. And we developed a code for handling things that happen outside of that space. And Goffin effectively pointed out that one would need to develop a new code to figure out how to manage continuity and presence in telepresence. It, it's not that it was impossible, um, but it, a new code needed to be developed. Just like deep sea divers could learn to communicate by using hand signals instead of words, telepractitioners would need to find other ways to bridge these divides. Eye contact 
posed other frame problems. And, and we know that even right now, all of us on Zoom, that we face a choice, right? I mean, I can either look at, um, I can either look like I'm looking at you in the face by looking at the camera, or I can look at the image I see of you by looking at the screen. Neither of them are really quite convincing, or I can look back and forth between one and the other, but that's even shiftier. So how does one actually frame um, intimacy in a telemedical encounter. Um, in other popular sociology at the time, the anthropologist um, uh, Edward Hall, um, whose who's, um, 1966 book, The Hidden Dimension, was widely popular reading, um, uh, was also attuned to the study of everyday life. And Hall developed a notion of proxemics, which telehealth practitioners latched onto as a way of engineering intimacy. So you know, in retrospect, Hall's social theory is sort of almost laughably one-dimensional, literally one-dimensional, right? Um, among white middle-class Americans, Hall described four distances of social interaction, intimate, personal, social, and public, each with a close phase and a far phase in which increase in distance, <clears throat> right, or a decrease in distance would let you know how intimate two people were in, in a relationship. So this could be coded precisely in units of length, right? Social far phase, which is maybe seven to 12 feet was a space of formal business and social interaction. Personal far phase at 2.5 to four feet is a literal arm's length interaction. Um, whereas if you get to kind of close near phase, it becomes really uncomfortable and leads to eye crossing, right? And all of these things are interactions two people might have in a given day, but they stage a certain level of social intimacy. So <clears throat> the, the point of this for telehealth practitioners is that you can engineer the right level of intimacy into a doctor-patient relationship by attending to focal length and set design and making sure the proxy mix fit. At what apparent distance, Park asked, does a physician cease to be a friendly symbol of help and become over-domineering or even a threat? And so where Bird and MGH hoped that a new media of telemedicine would augment the role of doctors in healthcare, and Park and Rockoff and Goffman hoped that a social science of proxemics could help engineer a better doctor-patient relation, um, there's others who thought you could do even more radical work, um, and that was to try to actually achieve symmetry. So Goffman pointed out that the disruption of a background in a telehealth encounter, like what we're having right now, actually also helps to disrupt the power of a physician in relation. So that the clinic that I'm in, the physical clinic right now, actually structures certain forms of power interactions already. Um, but in a telemedicine setting, he described, the situation can be restored to greater symmetry because the environment consists of two spaces. And um, that some patients might respond by actually being more relaxed by being in their own home setting, that a greater candor would come through that greater sense of agency. And indeed, some early results coming of a telemedical clinic linking, linking a public housing project in East Harlem with physicians in the nearby Mount Sinai Hospital suggested that some patients felt more comfortable on screen than in person, and that a similar change in power relations took place in the right to touch. In a clinical encounter, the doctor can touch the patient, but the patient can't necessarily touch the doctor in the same way, not without perhaps getting a call from security. But television restores that and that neither party can touch each other. And this idea that telemedicine could disrupt the power asymmetries in a paternalistic medical model was a very far cry from Bird's goals of amplifying the power of the doctor. But Bird would have been relieved to know that the, another medical sociologist, Elliot Friedson, thought that basically Goffman's account of this was just way out of line and far too fanciful, that the capability of television to undo doctor-patient asymmetries um, was overstated and that the technology could actually do exactly the opposite. The telemedicine, Friedson noted, makes it possible for everything to be prepped in advance so a doctor can simply come in like a surgeon and do purely functional work. I'm not sure I would argue there's greater symmetry between doctor and patient under these circumstances. If I'm right, this is indeed a selling point to doctors, particularly the super specialists who like to make use of every minute to perform their esoteric functions. But I'm not exactly sure this is the best thing in the world for human patient care. So <clears throat> telemedicine on this one-to-one -one level became a tool with disruptive potential, but also recognized to be a tool that might simply clamp down existing forms of professional control. Was the technology a tool for liberation or further oppression? Well, it's really hard to know. It depends on who's controlling the technology. But it was also recognized that this was a very American set of concerns, more specifically, a very white middle-class American set of concerns. And so at the end of his 1974 report on telemedicine, Ben Park briefly reflects on the limitations of this framework. 
um, that it's based like so much um, medical sociology at the time on a white middle class American consumer. And then not only did this lead to bias in the cultural dimensions of telemedical practice, but these norms were also built into the hardware of telehealth itself. So even the physical structure of the telemedical system was predicated on cameras that favored white skin and white bodies. The Plumbicon cameras used had a noted red bias that not, not only favored light skin tones over dark skin tones, but also detected inflammation on light skin with different sensitivity compared to detection of inflammation on dark skin. So the existing disparities in healthcare could also be augmented through differential access to a telemedical system that was designed with white middle-class bodies, minds, social groups, and behaviors in mind. So I wanna pause for a moment and then think how this gets deployed nationally in the 1970s. Um, and how telehealth becomes an area for investment in a belief of a technology that will suddenly allow access to healthcare for many who have not had access before. Um, and in the social health, it's oftentimes using these very chunky census categories in the, in the sort of liberal sociology of this time, Black versus white, um, Hispanic versus non-Hispanic, um, uh, you know, uh, American Indians living on the reservation versus, versus a mainstream white population. Um, I'll just give two examples here before closing. Um, one is um, the work of um, John uh, Norman, who was a, a you know a, a influential um, Harvard cardiothoracic surgeon, one of the first black cardiothoracic surgeons trained in North America. Um, and um, John Norman, um, you know, and, and Emily Harrison, who's here today, has done some quite some research into this as well. Uh, was a member of the 1969 Harvard Medical School Committee on Relations with the Black Community. Um, he described in his own book that year, Medicine in the Ghetto that a medical ghetto that affected communities and practitioners alike had, provi had provided entrenched disparities in access to care in urban areas. And his colleague, John Holloman, a New York-based physician and civil rights activist who criticized the racist exclusion of African-American physicians from the AMA that was still in practice in 1968, noted there was a tendency for many ghetto residents to view the establishment of satellite clinics, neighborhood health centers, and the like with some suspicion. Often when we look about us, it is very easy to discern the correlation between interest where none existed before in our community and the large sum of monies available for study, demonstration, and renewal. Wary as he was of demonstration projects and technological solutions, though, Holloman still held out hope that telemedicine could still provide a meaningful technological basis for undoing centuries of layered stratification and structural racism in American society. And he repeatedly pointed to, pointed to this emerging technology of telehealth as a possible solution, insisting that two-way closed circuit TV could be established to link the ghetto physician to the medical center, services that could be put in operation almost at once. So Holloman became head of public hospitals in New York City at a time when the New York State had been defunding public hospitals like Harlem Hospital that he had extensive ties to, to fund ventures linking private academic hospitals like Mount Sinai to inner city areas. And the building here, the Wagner Homes Projects in East Harlem, became a site for a major federally funded telemedicine demonstration project through Mount Sinai Hospital to demonstrate the role of this technology to expand access to care to inner city Black and Latinx patients. Now, it was headed by a second generation African-American physician in the Mount Sinai Department of Community Medicine, Dr. Carter Marshall. And Marshall is a fascinating character. He's in many ways, a social medicine practitioner, writes a textbook on dynamics of health and disease. He's aware that many East Harlem residents often resist setting foot in the hospital until they're so ill as to be beyond the reach of medical help. And Marshall hopes that the right kind of communications platform can help bring them into care at an earlier stage of illness and an earlier stage of life. And he envisioned this pediatric outreach program that could reach directly from Mount Sinai Hospital into the structure of Harlem's tenements and public housing project themselves using medical television. Um, here's a copy of his book. Um, you can say, like he, he, like Holloman, has a detailed knowledge of thinking about structural racism. There are two ways you can look at problems that involve the delivery of health services, he tells the New York Times, shortly after establishing this first telemedical link. One is to fix the structure of the healthcare system itself, and the other is to use technology to circumvent these fundamental problems. Our interest here, he continued, is how we can adapt technology to the delivery of healthcare services regardless of the organizational framework. So Marshall was surprised to find that most children and parents were immediately receptive to getting direct medical care over the television. In several cases, patients were more communicative with their healthcare providers over television than in person. 
And he speculated, especially with children, that this is either because kids are very familiar with television or that nurses are less threatening on television. Um, but the, the Mount Sinai team explained to their plans to the National Cable Television Association to expand this cable link to other health stations, schools, daycare centers, and ultimately into every home in Harlem. So what happens? The Wagner Homes Project is a success story. Um, it's it, in this one of one of many reports demonstrates that television, quote, can overcome the social cultural gulf that separates inner city residents from health care resources. But if the real goal was to provide as good care to as many urban residents as possible, some of the studies showed the television itself was less important than um, as, a, as a way of reaching direct patients than as a means of helping nurse practitioners operate more autonomously in neighborhood community health centers. Um, and uh, in this study by Charlotte Muller, an economist, she points out that actually five nurse practitioners could work in this health system with telemedical guidance um, for the price of one physician um, and reach five times as many patients. So by the time Muller's analysis is published, though, the television link already gets shut down. And it's shut down in the face of success. Um, by 1975, the federal contract was complete. This demonstration project showed that you could deliver high quality care that was accessible to inner city residents through telehealth and that had a meaningful impact. And having shown that potential, um, it had done its job. There was nothing in that federal contract to actually continue implementation. And there was nothing really in the subsequent years of telehealth markets to actually then develop telehealth programs for um, populations like the East Harlem population that was originally imagined around. Um, I, I'm running out of time here, so I'm not going to take you too much through analogous rural projects. I just want to highlight that there is um, a, a very similar story that takes place. So the, the largest federal investment in telehealth in the 1970s, which is the STARPAC um, initiative. And this um, Winnebago that you see um, taking telemedicine on the road um, is, uh, is the, the mobile health unit of the STARPAC project. And it's a collaboration between the National Air and Space, um, it, it, so NASA, the Indian Health Service, and the Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, um, effectively to design what is supposed to be um, initially the, the, the telehealth wing for a NASA mission to Mars. It then ultimately becomes the medical bay of the first space shuttle, and it's beta tested by um, stuffing this, um, this health pod into a, a Winnebago, driving it around the Sonoran Desert on the, um, then the Papago Indian Reservation of Southern Arizona, picking up sick um, Papago and pretending that they're astronauts, and then using that evidentiary basis to then um, launch the first space shuttle. Um, now, when I describe it that way, it seems extraordinarily extractive. Um, and media coverage at the time made the comparison between Indian and astronaut explicit emphasizing that common environments of absence and isolation prompted similar problems for the Papago, a people, quote, as isolated from medical care as if they lived on the moon. Um, but this project, it was a much more complicated arrangement between these three actors as, the, as this mobile health unit played the part of the space shuttle. And patients entered, found themselves inside this high-tech vehicle that was operated by, um, by Papago um, medics who had been trained specially to, uh, to, to develop health capacity. And then staffed, here you see Peter Ruiz, who is one of the um, Papago, now Tono Otham engineers, who helped develop the console with Lockheed on the Sunnyvale campus and who staffed and operated it. So I'll linger for a moment and say that um, Rosemary Lopez, who is the woman holding the, cam the camera, um, went on to then become the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Tono Otham tribe. Um, and that Peter Ruiz became the, uh, the, the, the Secretary of Interior Resources. So the, the, um, there, there's a complex scientific and technical career of Odham actors in this story. It's not merely an exploitative story. But where I want to linger is that StarPak worked. Um, it worked quite well. From NASA's perspective, the project was a successful demonstration. A space shuttle project moved forward with a new medical bay. For a few years, the Indian Health Service also could claim that its own research and development office was at the forefront of applying space age technologies to real world public health problems. So this engagement with technology gave a form of optimism and a boost to the IHS in its health equity projects. Although ultimately, once the demonstration was completed, the same thing happened, right? So the demonstration completed, HEW um, did not come through with further funding to continue it. The mobile health unit gets mothballed and eventually sold to Northern Arizona State University, where it's then used to televise football games. 
And the Papago tribe, now the Tono Otho tribe, is left with a mixed bag of, um, you know, an engagement which had helped to train some healthcare personnel and a lot of road building, but that until very recently, um, the Tono Otho tribe still did not have access to telemedicine, even though the nearby University of Arizona had one of the most ex extensive telehealth systems developed in the country. So that demonstration projects still remain demonstrations. Um, so both, they both succeeded, Wagner, Wagner Homes, the Starpack project, and they both failed, and that neither of them lived past the demonstration phase. So the direct federal investment in telehealth as a system of reducing barriers to access to care dried up and was effectively left as a creature of the market. And we could talk more in the Q&A about what happens in this current market space of enthusiasm around telehealth, especially in a post-COVID moment in which the hybrid lives that we lead are not going away, um, you know, uh, several of the patients that I saw in my physical clinic today were still telehealth patients, and there are many, many private ventures that are devised around the um, capturing this um, this need that is not, that is seen as a market. And this is, I think, the most uncomfortable aspect of telepresence. Only stated briefly in the archives I worked with that the system that promised increased access to healthcare actually contained within its very structure forms of racial and ethnic bias that work to increase rather than decrease disparities in access to healthcare, um, and. Um, I'm going to close just with this image, um, which is um, realizing that uh, actually audio only telehealth, um, noting that many patients that my clinic serves um, can only still access health through audio only means. Um, two of the encounters that I had today um, were audio only. Um, both of them were um, with um, older people who uh, you know, self-identify as African-American. Um, I'll show you a, a quick zip code map here. Here's 21210, which is um, the neighborhood that I live in, um, in Baltimore. Uh, median income, 100K, 9% Black, 5% Hispanic by census categories. Here's where I am right now, 21213 and 21205. Medium income, less than 40K, 87% Black, 2% Hispanic. And if you look at here at numbers, this is some of the reflexive work that folks at Hopkins Office of Telehealth Equity, which is a new office that really started up during the pandemic after the realization that this technology was widening disparities to try to see how do we build a more reflexive model such that we actually provide equity through these technological platforms. And what we've been finding is not only do we see a higher use of audio only telehealth um, as essential to access care um, by age um, and by, by zip code, right? Especially, especially associated with um, self-declared race and ethnicity. But that, um, you know, at the, on the one hand, there's, there's, there's a broad movement to say, how can we build the visual platform so that it can be accessible to all? And the other, there's a question of realizing that as the emergency of COVID is now formally, legally, you know, a thing in the past, at least on a federal level. There's a risk right now of funding for reimbursement for audio only telehealth being cut, which would, on the one hand, you know, one could say audio only telehealth is not as high quality as audio visual telehealth. And yet if that then by, by merely cutting this would actually take away the only means of meaningfully accessing telehealth for a substantial part of populations, especially a substantial part of populations that are marginalized, you know, his, historically marginalized communities by race, ethnicity, income level, um, and by age. Um, so if we're to think about telehealth as an instrument that can bend towards greater equity, we need to sometimes pay attention to working on multiple fronts at once and actually advocating for older technologies like telephones in healthcare today, even though the bells and whistles of a full audiovisual package is much more attractive. So again, we've gone through a lot today. I'm going to be quiet so we, we can get to questions. Um, but there's a fundamental disconnect with the kinds of things people are trying to structurally engineer in telemedicine with attention to framing, distance, set design, use of lenses, right? And the belief that somehow this technology could magically overwrite the steep social determinants that mapped out the geography of access and lack of access to healthcare in this country. And the answer I'd like to end with, which is in many ways, Ray, began with some, some of the lessons, some of the ways in which I feel that you know, Paul's um, scholarship and presence pushed us all is to think not that technology is the problem, but what is the way of imagining the kinds of technologies, the social suspension of technologies, the responsibility and governance around technologies, that we insist that they live up to their potential to actually produce a preferential option for the poor rather than the other way around. So thank you so much for your attention today, and I look forward to your questions. Jeremy, thanks so much. And as, as, as expected, you put a brilliant social medicine 
lands on, on this really prevalent issue right now. So thank you very much. Uh, and for folks in the audience, happy to have you submit questions through the Q&A, or if you want to speak, just somebody knows say I'd like to speak directly, and we can do that. Um, I, I was really struck, I was struck by a lot of things, but I was struck during the presentation that the MGH telemedicine service starts in April of 68, I mean, you know, this exact same month when, when Dr. Martin Luther King was, was assassinated. And you have these two groups, the ones that are theorizing telemedicine at one level, and, and, and the others who are thinking about disparities and, and access at, at other levels. Was anybody at the time, especially among those who were theorizing telemedicine, worried about the capacity for, the, for the, those technologies to, to you know, as that later JJ Markle would, would indicate, to exacerbate disparities? Was, was, was there, were there bridges between these groups of, of, of people analyzing and theorizing telemedicine at the time? That, that's a that's a really that's a really good point, um, Scott. And, and I it's something I struggle with, right? Which is trying to understand how is it that these when we look at the, the development of our own field and some of the lacunae in our own field, right? And I think certainly in the past few years, many across all of medicine, especially in you know in, in, the, in what we've come to call right this this dual pandemic of you know COVID nineteen and structural pandemic and structural racism made so visible after the murder of George Floyd and the kinds of institutional reckonings that at least were happening and hopefully still are happening right hopefully that window is still open realizing like how is it that a field like social medicine could be doing these two things so separately right you know how is it that attentions to disparities in access could be happening over here while sort of thinking about doctor patient relations and technology could be happening over here rather than together um but the short answer to your question is that i is that i still find very limited intersections right like you find someone like park briefly noting in a self critical moment that the sociological categories that they're using are so tied to this ideal, typical consumer of healthcare who is white and middle class, right? And they recognize that, and yet still don't bring the critical sociology of 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 race or of structural violence into the frame. Um, so it's a puzzle to sit with that that difference, especially because you know that some of the same people must have been in the same rooms on a regular basis. So here and there, there's someone like Holloman simultaneously talking in the medicine and the ghetto, ghetto conference about telehealth and expressing this, um, you know, this way of talking about technology as something that shouldn't be trusted, but still needs to be part of the, part of the picture. And, and I'm trying to look for those apertures. Yeah. Anyway, that's a long answer. I'll be quiet. No, it's great. I and mean, in some ways, it helps us to read back on the history of social medicine or not you know, you know, through this particular window, which is really helpful. Um, David Jones asks, given all this, what do you see as the future of telemedicine, especially the question whether it will increase or decrease disparities? So I, it's, it's open-ended, David, right? And, and I, I think so much has to do with governance. Um, so, and I'd love to hear more from this group in particular, because I'm, I'm giving a very domestic um, United States story. And there's a there's a related but, um, but different um, you know, hope and hype and challenge of what telehealth does in domains of, of, of global health, of course, right, both historically and right now. But I mean, I look to the present moment in which we have, you know, Londra Nelson in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, and um, greater attention to fields like community data. So who who owns data, who benefits from data, who who's invested in AI systems. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that there's a there's a capacity to set up this kind of a reflex arc of thinking reflexively that of insisting on an office of telehealth equity on a larger scale, um, which I would love to see come to pass. Um, I know there's some conversations happening in Congress around this right now. Um, so the short term is I would love to see some action take place to embed reflexivity in how we think about technology and disparity and access into an ongoing conversation and we're in a structure of governance. But as you know, this could this could you know that could change so easily in two years, or we could get we could we could only make it a short distance. Um, so I would say open-ended, one can be hopeful and engaged and yet also alert to the possibility that the technology can always lead to further divisions. Thank you. And, and we've we've opened this up so if folks want to talk, you can just you know raise your hand quickly and then just start speaking. Actually, Jerry, I want to have one question. Um, you know, given your, your your repeated capacity to really anticipate where important questions are heading in medicine, how did you first get interested in this particular topic? I mean, this, you know, to someone you know looking at you externally, they'd say, "Well, 
he was working on pharmaceuticals for so long. This is, seems to be in some ways a, a shift from that. What are the, what are the connections? How, how did this happen? So, I, I mean, I, I, the, the, short, the short answer is, um, is I, really most of my research comes from observations in the clinic. I mean, most of the, most of the questions come from something that comes up in, in clinic. And that's both an opportunity and a limitation because there's many other excellent questions in the history of medicine that I, that I won't see as a result. But I, I found myself shortly after having shifted from, um, from Harvard to Hopkins about a decade ago, realizing that in that shift, that the, the role of electronic medical record systems had also changed. And we had just shifted over to Epic. It was a new system. It felt very different mm -hmm. from the kind of home cooked electronic medical record systems that had been set up at, at the Brigham Women's Hospital. And it was, a, I realized it was a moment of increasing sedimentation of a kind of a consolidated, you know, you know, we know most EMRs are owned by a couple of companies right now, right? And so if the, the media of medical care, the electronic medical record was also an industry and that industry was consolidating and that was producing all kinds of burnout and challenges among physicians. And it was July of my first year here at Hopkins and I met the the director of the medical residency program, and I asked him how things were going. He said, well, you know, it's July. And so by now, we recognize most, most of the interns by the back of their heads. So in this moment of, you know, you know, basically a decade ago of recognizing um, deep discomfort in this, con in, in this electronic mediation of medicine as a business and of this thing that we all lived in, but ceded control to, I realized that there was a history that really needed to be explored. Excellent. Um, Annabelle, it looks like you wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> fascinating capturing momentum here. Um, I was wondering, um, Jeremy, whether you think that this is part of the renaissance of the 60s of 70s. So we are seeing a lot of, um, a lot of your sources from these days. Um, and like Plastic Soup, Club of Rome, self-organizing communities, uh, many a thing revives um, currently. What is the context and the conceptualization of then versus 50 years in? Um, was it that the protest in those days and the promising inventions were less well prepared and that we are more prepared now that they find more fruitful ground? Um, today, or what conceptualization or context might have contributed, and what elements will, in this case, in the previous question of David, um, have helped or be helping um, to launch them better and in um, more equal societies um, and, and, and more globally than all the local initiatives that in those days apparently um, did find fruitful rounds, but nowadays um, global um, should be the thing. Yeah, Annabelle, that's a fantastic question. And I'm clearly not going to have a, a quick answer to it, but I really appreciate the provocation. I mean, you know, what, what Scott says to the contrary, I'm not a good futurologist, yeah. right? And historians always disclaim that we can't do that. But the historical question you're asking is, well, in there have been many intergenerational conversations that have that have been sort of you know, picked up at this, you know, 60 year remove, right? So what is happening in, in terms of as memories of, um, you know, uh, forms of civic protest and social movements of the late 60s find echoes in some of the, um, you know, uprisings, um, youth activism, uh, and social movements of the current moment, you know, how do we look at these things together? Um, and so I think you're right in saying that this conversation I'm brooking right now, um, about the telehealth potential in the late 60s and then the telehealth sort of disappointments in the COVID pandemic puts them in opposition. Um, I, I do think that part of the transformation, which, which makes me perhaps more cynical, is the degree to which we invest um, you know, technological entrepreneurship as a site of social innovation and hope, right? So that so many of the humanitarian technologies that we are taught to trust in, right, have a kind of a basis of a, you know, the, the, a Silicon Valley funding pitch cycle. Um, or another way of inverting that would be to say, what I'd like to ask is how might we imagine a way of thinking about the equity potential of communications platforms 
that is detached from its market potential. And this is something that um, I kind of come to at the very end of the book by asking, well, why does it seem kind of pie in the sky to think that a television technology could actually help produce greater equity and access to healthcare, right? When at the same time, right, a television technology is proposed to produce greater equity in early childhood education, right? Literally this, the same time that telemedical demonstrations are happening, the first demonstration of what becomes the children's television network or what becomes Sesame Street is pitched as a potential way of using this new technology to increase access to early childhood education and level out steep asymmetries, especially within urban inner city areas um, or rural areas of underserved compared to more affluent white suburbs. And the interesting thing about the children's television network is that it, it actually succeeds quite a good deal in spite of a lot of scrutiny and in spite of a lot of critics. But part of the reason it succeeds is it's not held to the same kind of market expectations, right? So that there's a continued set of funding that goes into producing Sesame Street without requiring that it be financially viable in a private market. It also has a very reflexive model so that as those who are developing Sesame Street begin to realize that similarly, this technology, if it works, but is shown mostly to white suburban kids could actually increase disparities rather than decrease them. There's a, there's a substantial effort that goes into the children's television network to actually ensure that it is accessible and being watched and, and, and representing and accountable to those communities that it is purporting to serve. And that's that bit that the healthcare system does not do, right? So one of my interests right now in the present moment is how can accountability metrics like this Office of Telehealth Equity that cropped up here at Hopkins and has also cropped up at UCSF and many other places around the country, hopefully there's one at Harvard as well, you know, how can, how can the technology not simply be seen as a black box that will or won't help people, but as part of a system that on the one hand needs to be tended to and needs to have a lot of people at the table to make sure that it's accountable to those publics it's supposed to serve, but also not be expected to be profitable um, in order to be successful. And perhaps this is a facile connection between Sesame Street and telehealth, but it does expose the kinds of things that we impose on the future of healthcare technologies that both let them get detached from their social goals that are initially promised, and then also help to ensure that they need to be bent in, in, towards modes of profit and concierge medicine rather than the equitable models that we initially proposed them in. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jerry. Thank, thanks, Annabelle. So we're, we're at one o'clock, and I know folks probably have to. Um, Tune out. Um, but, but let's um, one more question. This relates to the questions of, of metrics and, and value. And it's how do you foresee quality of care factoring into being measured on a telehealth visit? Um, is this could be based on time or duration, patient feedback, something else? Well, that's a that that's a fascinating question. I don't have an immediate answer to it. Um, you know. Because I, I, I experienced this myself, and I think many you know providers, many patients, you know, there are some some of the even the telephone calls that I had today, I felt that I had really substantial connections with a patient, and, and I was able to use that time to really help them overcome a barrier or or, or a particular clinical problem they had today. And others feel um, like very suspended, kind of caught up in this medium, like like frustrating because. If you were here, I could really help you. And yet, because we're actually being seen at a distance, I don't know what to do. Um, so you're getting to this question of how do we actually ensure that there's a way of measuring the value that any given telehealth visit delivers? And um, that, I, that's an answer. I, I, I would love to see what this group does with it. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a really a global health delivery question. Yeah, it's showing for MGH. We have to we actually have to include our time spent on a telephone call if, if one's billion as a telephone call, which we only have to <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, I, I filled out a bunch of them today, but yeah. that's just a number, right? Like just, that's just documenting. Yeah, I spent 15 minutes on this one. I spent 20 on this, you know, um, that, that it's so hard to understand how that actually translates into actually quality. And, and one understands the desire that, you know, if this is to be accountable, how do we actually come up with metrics to measure that accountability? Well, super grateful to you. I mean, obviously, the book is amazing, and everyone's encouraged to go to go get it. Uh, you really enable us all to, to think through social medicine lens on, on, on this important issue, it's, it's so many issues. So, thank you again um, for audience members. Um, once you know that 
Uh, we're taking a little bit of a pause over over the winter break, um, but we're back at the end of January. Our next uh, we'll have back to back talks that are amazing. It's going to be Maxine Burkett uh, at the end of January, followed by Arthur Kleinman uh, the first week of February. So uh, between Jeremy and those two, it, 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 it's 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 a great series. Uh, thank you all for for attending, and Jeremy, thank you again for doing this. Um, thanks. It's a pleasure to see all of you. I, I, you know, I, 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 I miss seeing you in person, and 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 I and I, I love this chance to to briefly be present with with all of you again. Um, you know, I owe so many debts to so many of you, and it's so great to see you thriving.